My name is Max Derhack. I'm a principal scientist at Onyx Graphics. I'll uh, give you a little bit of an introduction to myself. I have a bachelor's in computer science. I have a master's in imaging science at R uh, Rochester Institute of Technology. And uh, at present, I'm working on a doctorate in color science with Rochester Institute of Technology as well. Uh, as I said, I'm a principal scientist at Onyx Graphics. I've been working with Onyx Graphics for about 24 years. Um, I'll be celebrating my anniversary next month. I am the vice chair of the ICC, the International Color Consortium, and for that body I'm also the chair of the Architecture Working Group where we've been working on um, ICC version 5. I'm not going to be speaking about that today. On a personal note, I'm married, has six children, boy, gr boy, boy, girl, boy, boy, girl. I was born up and brought up in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, and I currently live in Rochester, uh, New York, where I am working on my PhD. So let's talk about the elements of color. I'm going to give you a little bit of color science before we get into textile. Color is really basic. There's three primary elements that go into color. You start off with light. Now light can uh, either be uh, emitted as electromagnetic wave, uh, uh, radiation or photons of light that the, 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 uh, the observer will take and, and look. Or the light itself can interact with various surfaces. surfaces. Uh, it can actually go through the surface, like uh, transmitted through uh, like a backlit film or something like that. Or the light can bounce off the surface and reflect and be seen by the observer. Now the observer has some light sensitive sensors in it that takes it in and there's processing that goes on in the brain. And actually I could spend the whole 20 minutes just talking about this right here, but we're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the light surface interactions. To be able to actually understand how color works and interacts with textile, you need to understand how light can potentially work with, uh, interact with surfaces. And there's, there's multiple modalities in terms of how light interacts. The first one is basically the light will, will, will hit the surface and bounce directly off. This is like a mirror. It just bounces off at the exact opposite uh, uh, direction that it comes in. And so in this case right here, you're basically seeing the light source. The light can go in and it can go inside to the, uh, the, the, the surface and e eventually be absorbed by molecules within the surface, in which case the light ceases to exist as light and now it becomes heat energy or, or, or mechanical energy or something like that. Light can go in, it can bounce around from molecule to molecule. It, it's not necessarily a straight path and eventually it wanders its way out of the surface at potentially a different direction than it came in. Uh, diffuse light will actually reflect off of the surface in every direction equally. Light can also go through and bounce around between the molecules and eventually go out the other side. So it's, it's like reflectance except for it goes through and that's what's transmittance. And so a backlit film is essentially reflected light going through the surface itself. Now these right here are the typical, the, these two right here are really typically only things that are considered in terms of the graphic arts. It's either going to be a reflection print or a backlit film. But when we're talking about textiles, specular reflectance, that can be important because you can actually have light bounce off the surface itself. Other two aspects of, of, of the way that light can interact with the surface, light can go in and bounce around and eventually be absorbed by a molecule, but it doesn't stay absorbed there and it gets re-emitted as light at a different wavelength. So it may come in as ultraviolet light and come out as blue light, or it may come in as blue light and go out as green light. That's called fluorescence. And actually, Fluorescent light bulbs basically use that. They use a high energy and then the phosphors in there are actually re-emitting the light in, a, in, a, in the visible range. So, whoops, oh, wrong button. So with fluorescence, basically, we have a change in, in the, way, the wavelength of light. The last thing is interference, and this is basically like interference pigments. An example would be like you know, metallic, metallic inks and stuff like that, where light can come in and they go into the surface and they bounce out and the thickness of the surface is such that basically the light coming out either interferes constructively or destructively. You know, like the color you see on a, on a compact disc, that's actually a result of interference. It's not necessarily a, a, a pigment. Now, how a photon interacts in this is dependent upon the wavelength of light. Light that gets absorbed, you don't see. Light that gets reflected, you do see. So cyan absorbs red light, lets other lights go through. Um, <clears throat> And in some cases, there's angular aspects to it as well. Specular reflectance and interference are, are both aspects of where the direction is an important aspect of it. Now, when we're talking about textile, now it's getting textile, let's apply some of this surface, surface thinking. 
With normal conventional printing, like on paper or vinyl and stuff like that, we got a really flat surface. And in some cases, you know, like with a uh, photographic paper, there's different coatings that are actually part of the paper. I'm not going to go into any extent about those things. But generally what happens is the ink is applied to the, the media. It actually potentially gets, gets absorbed into that into the, the, the surface of the media, and then the surface of the media stays at the top. Light comes in, bounces around, reflects, and goes, goes out. And the thing about it is, is that <clears throat> because you actually have uh, potentially uh, the, the, the surfaces, you can actually have really high densities, really very, very, very colorful. When we're talking about textile, it's, it's a completely different story, because you're talking about little fibers that are actually being making up the, making up the surface of the textile itself. And so, in some places, you're going to actually have light bouncing off, and so you get that specular highlight coming off. In other areas, you don't necessarily have, uh, have that, and you get color. And because the surface itself is very, very uneven, trying to get the colorant evenly on all of the surfaces, because this is a very complex surface, you won't necessarily get it where you could potentially have a very nice, even coating in a flat surface. So textile itself fundamentally has some difficulties in terms of, or challenges, we'll say, in terms of how you get the, 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 the color in there and how you get it so that it coats the surface uh, well. Light that goes through is going to be disappeared. And so one of the differences between, uh, you know, paper and textile is it's going to re re react with the light differently and so you're going to get different kind of color. You won't necessarily get a saturated color, but when people print with tex textile, they're often very dissatisfied with the, the, with the darks because really you have these little fibers that are sticking up and those fibers are going to be very difficult to coat with colorant and they're also going to potentially reflect some of the light. So end up making it look lighter. So. When we're talking about uh, textile printing, and I'm talking about colorant, there's multiple ways of doing it. I'm going to talk about specifically uh, dye sub. Uh, with dye sub printing, well, <clears throat> you have ways of doing it without it. And in that case, you're trying to get the colorant to stick on top. And so getting it so it's evenly done, you're going to potentially have challenges. You have direct dye sublimation, where you basically have the medium itself is actually coated with some sort of a, uh, a coating that will make it so that when the, uh, when the dye goes in there, it will make it so the dye can be sublimated. I'll talk about sublimating in a, in, in, in a minute. Um, <clears throat> and with the direct dye sub, you know, you're putting it in the, in, in the, the media directly into the print printer, putting the ink directly into the media, and then you go into a process to get it so that the, 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 the ink becomes sublimated and, and uh, kind of cured onto the, onto the, uh, the, the fibers. With a, a transfer dye sublimation, you print onto a, a, a paper medium, and then the, with, from the paper medium, you're going to transfer the actual dyes into, into, the, into the media itself. In both of these cases, what's happening is, is we're sublimating the ink. Now, sublimation is a, a technical term for essentially going from a solid to a gas. Uh, for instance, uh, dry ice, you know. It's cold and hard, and when it dries, it, it never turns into a liquid. It turns into, in, into a gas. In this case, what, what, what you're doing is you're basically putting the, the, the dye in, in, into a solid form. It's a, either on, in, into the media or onto the transfer paper. And then with pressure and heat, you're going to basically raise it to the, the sublimating temperature so it converts to a gas. Now, when it's a gas, then it can it, it, you have really teeny tiny small particles in kind of a cloud that go in and cover the whole surface. And actually, that's in essentially, you know, using gases is how mirrors are coated and things like that. You can get very, very intricate detail into the surface. If you try to just do direct with, with, with the ink without the sublimation process, it may potentially not necessarily get all the pieces of the, of the, of the, the, the surface covered and therefore not necessarily as vibrant. Now, <clears throat> the sublimation process, you know, you're going to need to potentially, you know, image the thing onto the printer before you get the final output. Now, when we're talking about managing color with textile, um, there, there, because there's challenges uh, in terms of, the, uh, uh, of how light interacts and how uh, you have difficulties potentially in terms of having the measurement correspond to a physical estimation of what the color is. Because the, 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 the measurement device is going to shine light at 45 degrees and measure it at zero degrees. And light potentially will hit surface, and so some of the light's going to actually be measured is actually some of the, the source lights, which is not necessarily uh, it, expecting to happen. And so therefore, it's going to see lighter colors, and that color may not necessarily appear lighter to you physically. Um, 
because of that, uh, in many cases, an uh, automated process may not necessarily work. And so you also need to, in terms of printing on textiles, you need to have both automated and manual processes so that when the automated processes don't necessarily entirely give what you really need to for a variety of reasons, either for because of fluorescence or, or, or not being able to get really good measurements, uh, then you need to have the ability to, to print swatches, measure, uh, uh, and then use the, the actual color recipes either in the design applications or within the, the, the RIP system itself so that, well, like for name colors or for using uh, colorways where you can replace the, 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 the colors in the, app, in the, in the RIP application. Um, <clears throat> you're using basically the actual device values of colors that you physically see and know to be the, the colors you want. However, uh, we're here to talk about automated color, and so I'm gonna talk the rest of the talk here a little bit about automated color. So with automated stuff, what we were talking about is profiling the media. And in all actuality, the profiling process isn't necessarily dramatically different with textile than it is with, uh, with other uh, uh, print modalities. Um, it just really basically a very key uh, key aspects are, are process control and, and, and being aware of the challenges and, and figuring out ways to address them. So the first thing I like to talk about is the fact that when you're actually doing sublimation, the color dramatically changes. You know, we're talking about you know, uh, not only a physical, but potentially a chemical transformation here going from solid to gas as you, as you go into it. And so if you're going to do profiling, you really have to measure the final sublimated output. And actually, I would say for all the textile stuff, you don't necessarily want to do something that's just jetted on the printer. You maybe have to go through the fixation process or whatever process to get the final result. That is what you need to profile which potentially extends the time it takes to do. Uh, a, a really key aspect to it, and I, can't, I couldn't uh, uh, emphasize this more, is process control is incredibly important. And with, with textile printing, uh, the, uh, the, the, the coatings on, on the media, if you're doing directly, you know, if, they, if they vary, that can change the color. Yeah, the temperatures that you use, yeah, even varying uh, one or two degrees Celsius, can vary the, the, the end color result. The, uh, the pressure that's being used, that can vary, vary the results, the, 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 the media itself. So, um, <clears throat> and then, then there's also the printing process. If the printer itself is not printing regularly, you're missing nozzles or something like that, that can affect the color. So really basically, my, my, my real key here is you need to have good process control if you really want to actually have, expect to get good results out of automated uh, color management. Um, the second thing to, to, to know, at least when, when you're actually doing the, the, the transfer, is things get reversed. So that means everything that you're doing has to be in, reverted. So you either need to have your, your source images and your, and your source application revert them, or you can have a RIP engine that potentially reverses things. Um, within our product, we have a, an option where you can basically set up a, a workflow where things automatically get reverted, and that would be a very a good thing to, to, to do. Um, <clears throat> When you're doing the profiling process with our software, uh, the key thing is, is that you need to say print reflected even on the swatches that you print so that they actually, if you want the labels, and, and, and actually if you really want the device to be raising the right stuff, you need to do that. Um, second thing, as I've mentioned here, you know, surfaces of the fabric, they're not the same. You know, they're, they're, they're all over the place. And so this can cause great variability in your measurements. So, and there's weave directionality. And so really basically, if you're gonna be doing this, you really need to print out your color swatches multiple times in different orientations, measuring them, and then averaging the result to get basically an average idea of the color. Because you're not gonna necessarily get from one measurement of any one of those patches how it actually, actually works. And so by, by taking multiple measurements, you get more of a, a, a feel for the actual behavior of the color and the media. Um, Fabric itself also stretches and shrinks, so you need to have uh, within the within your printing application the ability to account for the stretching and shrinking, so that you get predictable results when you get for the final thing. And we have a resolution scale adjust that allows you to compensate for that. Uh, another thing about it is because you have the variability, and the other thing about it is, is especially for sublimation, it's a very non-linear process. Incre small very small increments of colorant can potentially result in huge increases in the actual final results because 
you, know, you, you may not see any yellow on the, on the transfer paper, and when you output it, it's like solid yellow. And so, because of that, you really have potentially a short range where where you actually have your color gamut. And so you may need to actually have a better sampling of, the, of those particular colors. And so in this case, it may be a good idea to actually have more patches so that <coughs> you actually have enough sampling of the, of the colors that are important for getting a, a good range. Um, as I mentioned before, the, 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 we have the aspect of fluorescence, and fluorescence is actually potentially a, a huge issue in terms of textiles because the actual uh, fibers themselves aren't necessarily white, and so you add, they may be more like yellow, and so if you add an optical brightener that converts UV light into blue light, the blue light plus the yellow ends up being roughly, uh, roughly white. However, what this does is this is actually converting light that the device is not seeing into light that the device is seeing. And so the device may actually see a whole lot of blue light. And so it'll actually then end up causing the, the profiles to, to, to compensate for that. And you end up with pulling out all of that blue light by adding yellow. And so your images can potentially appear yellow as a result of fluorescence. Now, to... Uh, <clears throat> get around that. I mean, fluorescence is one of those things that's really hard to get around. You can use an M1 measurement, which basically uses a, uh, the, uh, the <clears throat> relative relationships of, of, of light at different wavelengths, similar to, to, to D50, so that the measurements become much more meaningful. Um, it's a good idea to set up your, your, your system for the, for the process. If you're doing uh, uh, sublimation printing, not necessarily even on textile, but if you do on, on ceramics or things like that, uh, you may want to actually set up page sizes that are specific to what it is that you're actually working with so that uh, the, the, the swatches will be printed to the right size, the images you print are printed to the right size, and so um, getting things, you know, and also if you have a heat press that has a specific size, then you may need to, to, to worry about that. Um, this can help reduce waste and also a lot of frustration. Uh, so in conclusion, I'm really r running here fast. Uh, color is really a perception that involves light, surfaces, and the human visual system. And with the textile printing, there's lots and lots of opportunities. And I'm not necessarily big on, on, on the marketing, but I've, I've, I've seen that basically a lot of aspects in terms of the pr uh, conventional printing can be done within, within the textile world, for, from signage to backlit stuff to, and it's, it's nice because it's washable, it's, it's lightweight, it ships easy, um, <clears throat> but it has its challenges. It's not going to necessarily be uh, always as, 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 as colorful. It may not necessarily always be as, uh, as color, uh, uh, color stable. Um, but <clears throat> managing color can potentially have its challenges, and the real key here is you, you do the best you can and then you have to go to manual processes potentially for the cases where things don't necessarily work as well. Um, and really the important concept is, and I'll say this again, process control. Doing the same thing over and over and over. Any sort of change can potentially factor in to changes in color. And you'll see that the output comes out and it's wrong and you'll change one thing and something else potentially changes and you can end up ch chasing your tail trying to get, get better results. Um, that's all. Any questions?